So we are studying this quarter on the uncomfortable nature of Christianity. Uh, we studied from Luke chapter 14 a few week, weeks ago on uh, the fact that Jesus tells us that we need to count the cost if we want to be uh, one of His followers. And so we've looked at different things about Christianity that are uncomfortable, and tonight we're going to look at the challenge of the uncomfortable love. What a great topic to talk about in the middle of a uh, politically divisive time in our country. Turn to, for, to uh, the Gospel of John chapter 15. Gospel of John chapter 15. Beginning in verse 12, Jesus says, This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, the one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you slaves, for the slave does not know what his master is doing, but I've called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. When we were single... We could do what we want to do and spend our money the way we wanted to spend it. That changed a little bit when we started dating. The dating relationship starts making you uh, decide how you're going to spend your money and how you're going to spend your time. But when you get married, that really changes things. And then when you have children, <laughs> that changes things even more. Marriage is a sacrifice. And on a regular basis, we have to ask ourselves, do I want to have a happy marriage or do I want to serve myself? Because we can't necessarily do both. Marriage is about putting the other person first. It's about sacrifice. It's about the cross. Love found its ultimate expression in Jesus Christ, who sacrificed Himself for our sake. He traded His home in heaven for a fragile human form. And when Jesus was on earth, He endured shame and ridicule, torture and death in our place because He loves us. Everybody and his brother can quote John 3.16. There's a lot of atheists that can quote John 3.16. I want us to look at 1 John 3.16. The first letter of John, chapter 3, verse 16. In John's letters, especially 1 John, he also deals with Jesus' statement about love. But he also sends the discussion in a different direction. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 16, We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us. That's John 3, 16. And we, notice that, the last part of that verse, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. There is a, a challenge there that Jesus holds out to us to be self-effacing, to be other-serving, to be sacrificial. And that's the, that's the central idea of Christian love, to serve the other person. And this quarter, we're talking about counting the cost. And when Jesus calls us to be His disciple, He also calls us to serve one another. And that can be uncomfortable because it doesn't lead to a life that is glamorous. It leads to a life that is dirty. It leads to a life of sacrifice. It leads to a life often spent on our knees cleaning feet. 
And that's the core idea, but it applies in different ways as we live our lives. And so tonight I'm going to focus on four uh, aspects of this uncomfortable love that Jesus calls us to. This love that is countercultural, this love that is self giving, that is perfectly embodied in the nature of Jesus Christ, in his work, in his life, but it's also in his teachings. So, love is a commitment. In our modern culture, love is pictured as this touchy, feely, emotional kind of thing, having butterflies in your stomach. I had a friend in college who referred to it as chemistry. He dated this young lady, fine Christian young lady, and um, he decided not to pursue it anymore because there wasn't any chemistry between them. That was his word. In the Old Testament, God chose Israel. He chose Israel to be the, the avenue by which His Son became man. Family of Abraham. And the Israelites were not faithful to God's promise. They were not faithful to God's covenant. And yet God continued to work with them. Isaiah the prophet pictures God as a faithful bridegroom to a bride that was unfaithful. And time and time again, the nation of Israel walked away from God, and they walked away from the commitment that they had made to God uh, into an, an idolatrous relationship with gods around them, which the prophets, especially Hosea with his wife Gomer, the prophets picture as an adulterous relationship. And yet God still walked with them. In a very gra graphic text, uh, Ezekiel chapter 16, and it's, it's graphic enough to where I would be a little embarrassed to read the whole chapter uh, to an audience that had little children in it. But God pictures Israel as a prostitute who receives strangers instead of her husband. And rather than her being paid for her services, she pays other people for the services. And that's how God pictured Israel throughout a certain period of the Old Testament times. And yet God still pursued His people because His love is steadfast. And so if God is our model, and of course He is, then love is not primarily an affection, it's not primarily emotion, but it's a conscious decision based on a commitment that we made. Now, our culture just doesn't see it that way. Our society has conflated love and emotion as uh, love and emotion that has led to an unhealthy uh, expectations. Young people get married and they are naive and they think that everything is going to be fine once you put the ring on the finger and, and there's not going to be any issues and you're not going to have any disagreements and you're not going to wake up one morning feeling like that you don't want to do what you've been doing. We have these unreal expectations. And we think that there's going to be fireworks all the time, this chemistry um, that my friend used. Young people have... Uh, become obsessed with compatibility and relationships never get off the ground because there are too many fears about being the perfect fit for one another. Uh, and, and they've taken the idea of commitment out of the picture. Society today dislikes the idea that love is learned as a result of commitment. How much have we learned about the idea of commitment because of our marriages, our relationships. It means you don't walk away. I asked this question last week, week before last. What good does it do me to acknowledge and accept Rachel's weaknesses, Rachel's flaws? What good does it do me? And among the answers are, it teaches me humility, it teaches me to, to uh, recognize that I've got my own flaws. 
The notion that a relationship's longevity depends not on emotional vitality but on unflinching commitment is often distasteful. And that's why a lot of people, a lot of Christians, or those who claim to be Christians, see nothing wrong with divorce. Well, if you want to get a divorce, that's fine. Well, they happen, that, that happens in Hollywood all the time, doesn't it? You've got a marriage that lasts 30 days. And this couple says, well, we're not compatible. That's what they usually say. We're not compatible. So we walk away from the commitment. Penny? Yeah. Yeah. And it's this it's this consumerism mentality that we have as Americans that see a marriage relationship as disposable, just like plates and cups and forks and spoons and knives. Rachel's youngest brother was married for I think three months. His wife walked out on him. If love is an emotion, then it can come and go. Just like emotions do. Well, I fell out of love with them. And we hear that a lot. And that that shows that there's no commitment there. And the uncomfortable principle at the core of all of this is that love requires sacrifice. Turn to Mark chapter... That should be Mark 10. Turn to Mark chapter 10. Now, as you know, if you were here this past Sunday, my... First Sunday of the month sermon series is going to come from the Gospel of Mark, and I'm going to spend the whole sermon on Mark chapter 10, 1 through 12, because if we want to live a well-lived life, then we need to recognize what Jesus teaches on marriage and divorce. But it's, it's very plain. It is absolutely plain what, what the Scriptures teach on marriage and divorce. I want to pick up Ashley with verse 2. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him, and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce a wife. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? Notice the response Jesus always gives. What does Moses command? When people ask us Bible questions, we ought to respond the exact same way. What does the Bible say? Instead of sharing our ignorance, (laughs) we should say, What does the Bible say? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, and the two shall become one flesh, so that they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. So Jesus just reiterates what happened in the Garden of Eden in Genesis chapter 2. In the house, the disciples began questioning him about this again, and he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery. And that's, that's almost it. Now, Matthew includes, in Matthew 5, verse 32, Matthew 19, 9, if you want to write down those verses, Matthew includes one exception to remarrying, and that's if the divorce is for sexual immorality. The innocent person can remarry, the, the guilty person cannot. So that's what Jesus teaches, and, and that's, that's easy enough to understand. That's plain. And love cannot survive on the basis of emotional satisfaction. Love is a covenant. It's an agreement to be committed. And it requires faithfulness even when we're not feeling like it. Even when our heart is not in it. So a single young man might feel restless in his community and be tempted to abandon it for a new job or opportunity across the country. But for the sake of a commitment-based love for his friends, he decides to stay. A teenage girl feels frustrated about her parents and is tempted to break the rules they've established, but her commitment-based love leads her to honor her parents instead of walking away. A mom might dream of saving money and launching her own business, but her commitment-based love leads her instead to use that money to pay for her son's college tuition. Now, the examples that we could give are as varied as our own situations. Love is a commitment, and that makes it uncomfortable. Secondly, 
this love that Christ calls us to does not insist on its own way. Al. Okay. Um, two things. One is we always have to be careful saying, I can't imagine God, dot, dot, dot. This book right here is the only insight we have into how God thinks. And if we can't point to a book chapter in first, then we have, we have no basis of believing God believes anything else. That's the first response. The second response is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 10 and 11, if you want to write those two verses down. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 through 11. Paul says that, that if, uh, if a divorce happens, then the man or the wife should be reconciled to their spouse or remain unmarried. So if a woman is being abused or if a man is being abused, they might leave that relationship for the sake of their own health, but that doesn't give them a right in God's eyes to enter into a second marriage. So you combine 1 Corinthians 7 verses 10 and 11 with Matthew 5, 32 and Matthew 19, 9, and you've got, you still have only one reason to end a marriage and begin a second marriage but in a situation like you've described, they might end that marriage, but they don't have God's permission to enter a second marriage. Anything beyond that, we're assuming authority that we don't have. All right? Good question. Very relevant question. So love serves. Love is mutual. It's uh, relationships where only one party sacrifices is unsustainable. So in a marriage relationship, just use as an example, we don't talk about a husband gives 50%, a wife gives 50%, because that's not how marriages work. That's not even how relationships work. Friendships don't work that way. Because if there are times where a friend is having a bad day, we may have to go above and beyond in order to be patient with them. Now, obviously that is true in a marriage relationship. So I have to give 100% of myself to Rachel. Rachel gives 100% to me. And there are often times where we can't give 100% because of whatever's happening uh, during our day. But love at its, at its best only works when each person gives more than each takes. I am doing some uh, counseling right now and I told uh, the person that you can't keep giving emotionally without receiving emotionally. That's a parasitic relationship. And that's not what marriage is about. But the kind of service that Christ calls us to might look like weakness to the world. But weakness in the eyes of Christ is a strength. When we are willing to be vulnerable to our friends and to our family, and we're willing to serve. And one way we can embody that radical nature of serving others that Christ calls us to is by truly being present in the lives of others and giving them our all. For example, if we're in a conversation with someone, then we are not distracted. Turn off our cell phones. Now I'm talking to the wrong generation when I say that, but we turn off our cell phones so we can give the other person our undivided attention. And we exercise humility by being good listeners, by being quick to hear and slow to speak, listening to what somebody else has to say through the whole thing instead of trying to think about how we're going to respond before they're finished talking. This is love that served, that serves in... It's a love that sometimes it finds itself being inconvenienced. 
Sometimes I get called in, in the office and somebody wants something or needs something and I'm thinking to myself, wow, I've, I've got a Bible class to prepare. I've got a sermon to write. I don't want to get out of my chair. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. Because <laughs> it's not always easy to serve that way. Sometimes just being hospitable can be, can be inconvenient. But love was not intended to be hidden. In fact, you might even suggest that love can't be hidden. It's going to be visible because it serves. And when love is outward focused with a mission beyond itself, then love flourishes. That's the nature of love. And going back to our marriages, and the same thing would be true for friendships, it's not for us. My marriage to Rachel is not primarily for us. It's for Christ. Her relationship to me and my relationship to her ought to be directed towards glorifying Christ, which means it's not about me. And our friendships ought to be the same. So love serves. Number three, love also pushes us towards hospitality. And by this I really mean that love does not... How did I word it? Love is not enabling. That's what I was looking for. Love is not about enabling somebody else to engage in a sinful behavior, a self-destructive behavior. Love sometimes disciplines. Love sometimes speaks the truth when the other person might not want to hear the truth. I was writing our Bible study from Hebrews chapter 12 for the last the leaders hold firm study this afternoon in the office. And I was looking at Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 through 7 where the Hebrew writer talks about the fact that God, lo God disciplines the one he loves. God disciplines the one He loves. So love pushes us towards... Um, I should have put holiness, not hospitality. Love pushes us towards holiness. And that is living right based on God's Word. Sometimes love hurts, as the Hebrew writer says. In fact, let's look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Let's begin reading it at uh, verse 4. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood, and you're striving against sin. And you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do, you re do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers to discipline us, but we respect, and we respected them. Shall we not much rather be subject to the Father's spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good so that we may share His holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. So here the Hebrew writer is speaking in broad general terms about the purpose of, of discipline. And he says here specifically that the Lord disciplines us in order to make us righteous. The Lord disciplines us in order to bring about righteousness. That's the end of verse 11. So love hurts sometimes because love does not sit idly by while someone we love injures themselves. And I'm talking spiritually speaking. Let's look over at John chapter 8. You're probably familiar with I know you're familiar with this text, John chapter 8.
Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery, and having set her in the center of the court, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now in the law of Moses, now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What then do you say? And let me stop right here. What is wrong with the the Pharisees' approach, with the Pharisees' statement? Okay. All right. No grace, no mercy, no compassion. Uh, Marvin? I was going to say, it's not complete. How is it not complete? It's not complete because they brought a woman since she was caught in the act of adultery. And if there was a man with her, he was supposed to be stoned also, and he wasn't there. Yeah. Yeah, the law of Moses commanded both of them to be stoned. And there's only the woman. Which suggests, based on uh, uh, what uh, Gordon had said, their motivation was impure to begin with. Anytime we obey the Bible, anytime we obey God, if we're doing it with the right motives, it's in order to glorify God. They're not wanting to glorify God here because they're not obeying the law of Moses. They're picking and choosing what they're wanting to do. Because fundamentally, they're wanting to trap Jesus. That's their motivation. Jesus is very popular with the people, and nobody wants to stone a woman to death, and so they're wanting to trap Jesus and make him unpopular with the people. And John tells us that in verse 6. They were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. Jesus stooped down with his finger and wrote on the ground. Now, what did he write? (laughs) <laughs> we have no idea. One of the great mysteries of scriptures. Let me ask you this. Why did he write on the ground? Obviously, this is also speculation, but what, what do you speculate? Why did he write on the ground? Now, if Rachel was in here, she would offer some idea because we call her the great speculator. <laughs> she always speculates about everything. Marvin? Okay. I've, I've heard speculation was all it was from other preachers that it could have been he was writing out with his finger sins that each of the men that were there to have this woman convicted writing their sins down on the ground so that they could see what was being written. I don't like I said, but nobody knows what it was, but that was purely speculation. Hosea six verse six, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Now we don't know. We don't know why he did it. I, th- I think there's a reason why, and that's the reason why John writes it in here. But God didn't see fit to tell us why. But it does force them, verse 7 says, it forces them to persist in asking him. And so he at least is building up suspense, if nothing else. And so he says to them, He who is without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. So he's challenging their sincerity, right? Calling them hypocrites, basically. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. When they heard it, they began to go out one by one, beginning with the older ones, and he was left alone, and the woman where she was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Now here's the mercy and compassion that Gordon mentioned. Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. And then the second part is the holiness that Jesus calls all of us to. Jesus says, from now on, sin no more. So notice Jesus acknowledges that she she sinned. She was involved in a relationship that violated the law of God. But then he said, stop sinning. 
So Jesus acted with empathy and with love, but then He called on her to stop her sinful behavior. Now society tells us that love means accepting others just as they are without asking them to change. The rainbow stickers that we see all over the place. That's just one among many. Accept me who I am. Um, whatever religion I am, accept me for who I am. That's what society tells us is love. But biblical love is not about solidarity with people who are in their brokenness, but biblical love is about committing to challenging each other to live holy lives. One of the purposes of worship, Hebrews 10 and verse 25, is to challenge one another to love and good works. So Christian love is about committing to each other's holiness as well as our own and helping each other live lives that reflect the nature of God. Penny? Right. Right. Unfortunately, a, a lot of times those kind of signs mean God loves you the way you are and He's okay with you staying where you are. That's what the sign generally means. And yet, obviously, it does, uh, not from God's perspective. God calls us from now on sin no more. Marvin? The, uh, the song we sing just as I am, as much as I love that song of the denominational world, I know a lot of them, they jump all over that song saying, you don't have to change, he loves you just the way you are. It's just, Penny was just to say. Yeah, so Hebrews 12, to go back to Hebrews 12, God loves us where we are, but then he calls us to leave where we are and become more holy, to become more like him, to walk according to Christ's commandments. And that's the kind of love that God calls us to. Not to leave somebody in a, rela in a situation that we know violates the nature of God. Love calls on us to share with them what God says. God's love is grounded in discipline and His love demands righteousness. We just spent six months studying 1 Corinthians. Um, and the next New Testament work, book we're going to study, and we're going to, after we finish this class, and we're going to study Lamentations and the Song of Solomon, and then we're coming back to the New Testament and studying 2 Corinthians. We need to follow 1 Corinthians with 2 Corinthians, right? 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. In Paul's letters, he is constantly dealing with problems uh, in the churches. But his letters are balanced between rebuke and discipline that is inspired and grounded in love. Again, to use the, the metaphor of parents and children, we discipline our children because we love them. And the Apostle Paul is writing this letter of 2 Corinthians because he loves the Christians there. So 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4. Paul says, Out of much affliction and anguish of heart I wrote to you with many tears. This is apparently referring to 1 Corinthians. Not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. And of course, Paul called on the Christians in Corinth and 1 Corinthians to stop their sinful behavior. And a lot of their sinful behavior stemmed from false theology. And so, almost every chapter in 1 Corinthians deals with a doctrinal issue, a doctrinal problem, a theology problem. And so Paul was writing to correct that. Whether the people we love are, 
are penitent in their sins, are not walking in step with the gospel, which is Paul's words in Galatians 2 and verse 14, we need to confront, we need to do it with love, we need to do it with passion, we need to do it with patience. We don't need to do it hypocritically. But just because I'm not perfect doesn't mean that I don't need to challenge you in your imperfections. And you challenge me in mine. And when we do that, then we're helping each other be holy as God is holy. The fourth and last quality that we look at tonight relative to this uncomfortable love that Jesus calls us to is the fact that we are called to love our enemies. That's the hard one. God doesn't love us because we're lovable. Now, quite honestly, I am lovable. I'll just be honest with you. I'm lovable 24-7. Now, if you ask Rachel, she might give a little bit different answer to that, right? God loves us even when we rebelliously undermine His rule and, and flee from His righteousness. And Christ died for His enemies. So, this kind of love that Christ calls us to means we don't love to get anything. We love to be obedient because He first loved us. Back to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. First John 4, verse 19, we love because He first loved us. Doesn't Jesus teach us that we forgive because He first forgave us? Doesn't James tell us that we are merciful because He was first merciful with us? So love calls us to action. Love calls us to serve our neighbors. Love calls us to wash our friends' feet. Love calls us sometimes to hang out with sinners. Love does. And that costs us. And of course, as Marvin pointed out, the hard part is doing these things for people who don't like us. It's a whole lot easier for me to serve people that like me it's a whole lot easier for me to serve people who serve me. It's a whole lot harder to put the hear, ear on a man who came to arrest me. Who am I talking about? It's that event, but it's not Judas. Jesus put the ear back on Peter cut off the soldier, the ear of the soldier Malchus, John tells us, I believe it was John tells us the name of the servant of the high priest. So he comes out to arrest Jesus. Peter cuts his ear off. A good suggestion is Peter was aiming for the neck. And Jesus puts the man's ear back on, who came out to arrest Jesus. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 44. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We want to pray for our enemies, but here's, the, here's how we word our prayers. God, help them to understand their behavior is wrong. Now, there's, not, there's nothing wrong with that prayer, but I don't think that's a Christ-like prayer if that's the extent of it. God, bless that man in his relationship with his wife. Bless him and his children. Bless him and his job. Help him to get home safely. While we tend, we may not pray it this way, but what goes through our mind when that person cuts around us, cuts right in front of us on the interstate, we think it sure would be nice if he wrapped his car around a telephone pole up there. That's our instinctual reaction, I think. 
rather than saying, I pray he gets to his destination safely. Nadine Collier lost her mother, Ethel, who was one of the nine victims in that church massacre back in 2015 in Charleston, South Carolina. She was given a chance to address her mother's killer, uh, killer and Collier choked back tears as she forgave him. She said, you took something very precious away from me. I will never get to talk to her ever again, but I forgive you and have mercy on your soul. If God forgives you, I forgive you. My sermon Sunday morning is, going to, is titled, Praying for Justice, coming from Psalm 7. I preach from six psalms in the year. April, we start our seventh year here at Swartz Creek, and so I start off with Psalm 7. The closer I get to Psalms 25, the closer I get to retirement. Because my last year here will be Psalms 25, Psalms 50, Psalms 75, Psalms 100, Psalms 125, and Psalms 150. That will be the six Psalms I preached my last year here. Praying for justice. Psalm 7, among other passages, teach us to leave justice in the hands of God. We are to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. This type of love calls on us to clothe the naked and feed the hungry and welcome the stranger and minister to those who are sick and the imprisoned. And that, of course, would include our enemies. That would include people that are not on our Christmas card list. I am not for open borders, but we need to love our immigrants. We need to serve those who need to be served. It is so very important, even in this highly charged political environment that we're in, that we love our political opponents. matters that we disagree on from a political perspective, we ought to be able to disagree about those without losing our Christianity. If we were taught that you never talk about politics and religion, we were taught wrong. We ought to be able to talk about politics and religion without losing our Christianity. We should be able to respect somebody and respect their viewpoint. I heard somebody say not too long ago, I can't understand why somebody would vote for dot, dot, dot. If we can honestly say, I don't know why somebody voted for the other person, we're not listening to the other person. And that's a shame on us. I ought to be able to verbalize, I understand why somebody voted for that person. I disagree with them, but I can understand why they did it. If I can't say that, then I'm not listening. And the uncomfortable nature of love caused me to listen. Now, early Christians were characterized by this sort of love. I'm talking about from the New Testament times on for about the next 300 years. Early Christians were known for their love for one another and for their pagan neighbors. I've given you this quote before, at least twice before, because it was in two separate sermons and somebody reminded me that I used that in a prior sermon. But a pagan emperor of Rome observed that it was Christians' benevolence to strangers... And the fact that the impious, notice he calls them impious Galileans, he's referring to Christians, support not only their own poor, he says, but ours as well. Christians in the early centuries of the Roman Empire were putting the pagans to shame because the Christians were taking care of the pagan sick. Well, guess what that caused? It caused the pagans to leave the Roman paganism and become Christians, followers of Jesus Christ. And we sing that song, may they know that we are Christians by our love. Not because we are great, because 
the love of Christ compels us. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 14. Anybody have any thoughts or comments or questions that you'd like to add to our discussion tonight? Yes. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. That's Luke 17, verses 3 and 4. You know, in a situation like that, for whatever reason, we like to not talk to people. Especially somebody who's hurt us. Maybe it's because we, we want to put up a, a, a barrier to our heart so that something worse doesn't happen. But in a situation like that, what would be wrong with this... They're, they're brothers? Yes. Okay. What would be wrong with the man going to his brother and saying, you know what, this happened many years ago? We, we seem to have put it in the past because it looks like you're treating me as if it didn't happen. Do you regret it happening? Well, I think, I think he would like to do something like that because he's looking for that response from him to say, I'm sorry I did this to you. You know, he's maybe said things to other people in the family that he regrets what he's done and he did wrong, but he's never actually said it to his brother. Right. And, and so that's where he was, he's, when he made the comment, I've forgiven him, but yet he still won't reach out and try to say, make amends and have a relationship again. Um, and I found myself sometimes being in that position where I had someone throw me under the bus and in my mind and to God, I said, I forgive him. But I never confronted him. I never went to him and said, you know, because he probably views it as he never did anything wrong. But this was right after I was saved in 2012. It was three days after that this happened. And then a couple of days later, I it, Maybe the Holy Spirit convicted me or something and said, you need to forgive him, and I did. I mean, I, he never said anything to me to say I'm sorry or anything. I just said, I forgive him. And I was, I was lifted and lifted off of me, and I just was able to move on and not have any animosity or anything. It goes back to the very first point that I, was, that I made, and that is love is a commitment. If I've got a relationship with you, if I've got a, a friendship with you and I'm committed to that friendship, then I don't want anything on the outside affecting that friendship. And so if I've done something to the friendship or if you've done something to the friendship to affect that relationship, then I should come to you and say, hey, we've got some issue here that's affecting this relationship between us. Now, I have to have the humility to recognize that I may have misunderstood what you said or what you did. I have to have the humility to say, you know what, I was wrong. I perceived it wrong. You did something to me and I thought it was a bad thing, but as, I have, have, as you've explained it to me, I see where it wasn't. It's a misunderstanding or whatever. But I think that's what he needs to do is go to him and say, hey, we've got this issue that's, that's, that's not resolved yet. 
And maybe all it takes is him saying, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I think he needs to go to him and say, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for you to, to verbally express some regret that this has happened. And then he's going to have to deal with it. He can. He can treat him as if it never happened. Now, ultimately, forgiveness is in the mind of God. If, if the man de never does anything to be forgiven, then God won't forgive him. But the brother can treat him as if he hasn't done anything, and he's going to have to deal with his relationship with God on a separate issue. But he can, he can uh, treat him positively and, and lovingly. And I think that's kind of the approach that I took to the of my boss that did that to me. And I didn't need him to say I'm sorry for what I did the other day. Right. I just felt that day it came over me. I need to forgive him because I'm the one who's in prison for this. Mm -hmm. I'm the one who's tormented over this. He's not. He didn't beat me. He doesn't think he did anything wrong. So I was the one who was really suffering from it. And that's when I felt I could let it go and, and just say, you know, Sometimes people show by their behavior that they're sorry. They may not verbalize it, but their behavior shows it. We ought to verbalize it. We should. But for whatever reason, sometimes we don't. Our, our mission intern has written a little small commentary on Nahum, the minor prophet. Um, you could order them from Amazon. I would, or actually, I would encourage you to go to his, his blog, gospeltraveler.com, and order his commentary, uh, if you would like, uh, from his... It's 42 pages. It's a little commentary on the minor prophet Nahum. Uh, and all the money that he gets goes into a fund that he's using to set aside to do mission work. So it's a neat way of supporting his desire to take the gospel of Christ overseas. So gospeltraveler.com if you'd like to order a copy of his commentary. Glad to see everybody tonight. We are dismissed.